Well, I'm really looking forward to um, to this conversation with today's guest because uh, not only is he one of the most knowledgeable people uh, I know in the in the field of the world of coaching, <laughs> but also uh, he's prepared to. Uh, you know, create a robust conversation, robust debate, you know, it doesn't always have to be about being in violent agreement with each other. So Chris Cushion, welcome to the show. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. And I also leap buildings in a single bound. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, I, I you say, I, I said all that at the start and I, you know, sometimes I, you know, I, I can be prone to the bit of hyperbole, but when it comes to, you know, kind of research and application for that matter, oh. you know, as both a theorist and a system builder and a practitioner, you know, there's there's not many people who have, you know, talked the talk and walked the walk as you have. Yeah, that's very kind of you to say. I, I think I feel immensely privileged, actually, to be, it can be very challenging at times, actually. Mm. I think my very first, um, the very first line of my PhD, however many years ago, was like living in the nexus, that space between <laughs> between the two worlds. And I feel very, very much that I live in that space, really. Absolutely a coach. You know, love working with players, love educating coaches. That's really, really important. But also fascinated by exploring underlying theory and concepts and how those two spaces work together. And if I'm honest, you know, some people have got that and some people haven't. And I've sat in lots of really interesting presentations from colleagues in the academic world who patently have never coached for a moment in their entire lives so their ideas are really really interesting but I'm sitting there thinking about a group of players or a group of athletes and going yeah that's never flying ever mm -hmm. so that you're onto something for sure but that that needs a lot more <laughs> you need to get on the ground and work with that on you know in the field you know give it some ecological validity and see where it goes but you know there's a germ of an idea in here but you're, you're, you're presenting it as something almost like a fait accompli mm. and probably isn't. Well, we've, we've touched on um, your kind of career to date. So just in case there are people out there who haven't heard of you, they should have, but if they haven't, <laughs> then uh, I, wouldn't, I, wonder, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just giving the kind of brief resume. Yeah, of course. So I'm currently head of coaching at England Netball. I've been doing that a year. Um, just over a year. I'm doing that part-time. I'm also a professor of coaching and pedagogy at Loughborough University, which I do part-time. Uh, I've been at Loughborough since 2007. I started in academia in 2000, so it's 22 years. Uh, started researching probably in 98, uh, looking seriously at what coaches are doing and why, really trying to get under the skin of that and kind of that all unfolded. Uh, started I say coach my first session. I, I stood and watched people run around for an hour <laughs> and loosely called it coaching in uh, 1989. So I've been coaching quite a, quite a long time. My main sport is football. So um, I've coached pretty much every age group and in pretty much every domain in football, work with a range of clubs and organisations to help develop coached, uh, coach education and coaching systems. And that work now kind of expands out into other spaces. So I work with the military and the police as well, trying to instill some pedagogical or some different thinking in terms of training and development. Cool. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to dig into. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I guess in the, the starting conversation, I suppose, is um, one of the reasons I guess we decided to come together is we were we were having a bit of a conversation in the Twitter sphere, which never yeah. ve never very easy to do. Right. Um, around this notion of instruction. I know you've done a lot of research in this space and I've had one of your collaborators, Ed Cope, on before yeah. we were, yeah. with, with a paper that you produced previously, the pair of you. And I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding or at least I've got a misunderstanding around this notion of instruction. Yes. And so I wanted to see if we could start there and then we can see where the conversation takes us. Nice. So, yeah. so I, guess, um, I guess the starting point for me is you have, in my opinion, I think um, you have a kind of a reconcept. I describe it as a reconceptualization. You might not, but of, of what direct instruction actually is. Yeah. Most people, when they talk about instruction or direct instruction, are thinking of one thing, and you're saying it's actually something else. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if you wouldn't mind explaining that a bit more. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> so, for me, I think there are there are a range of pedagogical models available to us as coaches. There are. Um, you know, there, there's like five or six different games-based or game-centered models. 
there's a CLA approach, which kind of is in that game centered space, but has a different theoretical underpinning. Um, and then direct instruction is a, is a pedagogical model broadly. So, but what's happened in, what's happened in sport coaching particularly is if we, if we, if we wind the clock back to the seventies, the 1970s, and we go into the cut into the gym of John Wooden and we're there with Tharp and Gallimore. And they are observing his coaching practice, trying to understand what they can learn from this incredible coach. And they designed an instrument to capture his behavior. So they they created systematic observation. And they found that his behavior was in, largely instructional. About 60% of it was instructional. But But a shorthand for that was instruction included... <laughs> Demonstration, modeling, re-instruction, giving feedback, um, a whole range of behaviors which were clustered under instruction. And later observation instruments, whilst whilst instruction is a discrete behavior on its own, there was a there was a group of behaviors which were instructional. And that really for me became the basis of direct instruction in that space. So it's a cluster of behaviors which support the learner. Now, what's happened over the years, and I'm, I've contributed to this problem, I think, is that as that particular methodology is kind of faded in and out of fashion, people have narrowed instruction to literally the single behavior of instruction and, and reduced the idea of instruction being a cluster of behaviors to this single thing. And it hasn't. It wasn't helped as well in the in in the eighties, I guess, when we when leadership arrived on the scene and we started talking about autocratic and democratic leadership, and being autocratic was just telling somebody something. You just tell them to do it, give them a command, command, and so we have this conflation of a single behaviour of instruction, this notion of command or telling. And, and fast forward to now and over layers and layers of years and this being misunderstood and arguably misrepresented in coach development and coaching, we have this notion where as soon as we say instruction, we automatically think of a person standing there just telling somebody what to do. Now, in a literal sense, they are instructing, but that's not the pedagogical model of direct instruction, which is far broader and includes a whole range of behaviours in terms of supporting the learner. So I think, you know, it's... The unintended consequences of well-intended actions. So I don't think anybody's deliberately set out to do this, but we've just, through these various things, we've ended up in this space with instruction being very narrowly defined and connected to telling people what to do, and that's it. And that is not the pedagogical model of direct instruction. Um, right, well, that's, that definitely clears things up, and that's helpful. Um, so actually... The notion of a cluster of behaviours that come under the umbrella of instructional in nature mm -hmm. and and direct instruction describes that. Is that right? Yes. It's a pedagogical model, which mm -hmm. includes, I mean, it, 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 it you know, again, it, it has a theoretical underpinning and it's strongly linked to cognitive psychology, which is fine. So it has a, it has a strong, it has a strong link to cognitive psychology, unsurprisingly, because the people who came up with this idea were, were psychologists in that space. So they, you know, they, they've connected it. So I get that. So there is a theoretical underpinning to it, but it's also, um, yeah, it, it's, it's just that it's, it's a collection of range. And I, I think, you know, how research has been reported, the short, the shorthand has become, you know, the, almost the norm. You know, you almost like the workaround has become the thing we think that it is. <laughs> the shorthand isn't the thing. So there's a whole range of, you know. So when you read those papers from the 70s and 80s and they talk about instruction being the largest behaviour, they're not talking about a single instruction. What they've done is they've clustered that group of behaviours together. And that's why it probably is the largest set of behaviours. When you start looking at demonstration, modelling, questioning, providing feedback, concurrent, um, post in, you know when you including instruction that's quite a lot of what coaches do so it's hardly surprising that it would be reflected in um you know in the data and, and it's really interesting as well i saw somebody again in the twitter sphere post something with some some of john wooden's original data talking about instruction and being quite critical saying you know where do we ever get a place where we just stand and tell people what to do 
And it's like, well, that's not one jo what John Wooden did ever. <laughs> it's, it's really not. He, he, you know, he, he talks about drills, but his drills were three on two, two on two, two on one. Yeah. So they weren't, you know, it was, you know, again, we've got this idea of what a drill is, but again, maybe it's an Americanism. John Wooden never did drill, never did practices like that. And he never stood there and told people what to do. It was mm. very, it was, they were interventions, they were interactive and it included a range of behaviors. So modeling, feedback, questioning, all of those things would have been his instructional behavior. So mm. again, that kind of, that misunderstanding thread gets pulled quite a, quite a bit, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that I think that I think this is probably a common theme with a number of, I guess, uh, language artifacts, I suppose, yeah. in the world of coaching, okay. which yeah. think th things things that mean one thing that have come to mean another. Correct. <laughs> Drill being a really good example, which yeah, yeah, it, totally. It's it's kind of a it's and it's a bit lazy. I guess that's probably one of the reasons I challenge the word is because it's used lazily to describe a whole range of practice activities, but in right. reality should be, con in my view, should be confined to a particular type of practice activity. Yeah. And then we need better descriptions of the other, other activity forms. So I've been quite draconian in netball. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we call, we just call it, we just call it drill is now a, you know, we don't use the word. And I, I yes. just, I just, uh, <laughs> you know, again, I was at a level two, uh, with some learners and the tutors and they were talking about it's like it's a practice so every, you know and I was very quite pe pedantic about it every time they said drill no it's a practice activity yeah so just try yeah. to encourage people to think about practice activities rather than a drill because straight away it p there's an image in your mind of what that is or isn't and like I say John Wooden drills for him were three on twos two on twos two on ones but that's that's quite again that's kind of an american american type of language isn't it from that time yeah um, but yeah. we've picked it up and run with it and think it's something else and it's like well no it, it isn't that um in so just circling back to this notion of um instruction what i mean what what do we what do we do here because i think i guess one of the things that i was i guess trying to articulate is yeah it's almost as if you needed a marketing campaign on the word of instruction because on, on the notion of instruction, because if, if people have now taken it to mean something, well, got two choices, I suppose. Yeah. If people have taken it to mean something, should we describe the, the, the kind of cluster of behaviors that come under this umbrella of instructional somehow differently and not even use the word instruction so that people understand it as being something different yeah. or should we just work really hard to get people to understand what they're actually talking about yeah i think i would go with the latter for me i'm I, you know i'm very comfortable with direct instruction being a pedagogical model and that's all you need to say. It's a direct instruction is a pedagogical model. It's not just a single behavior mm. job done, right? And then people might say, well, what is the model? All right, well, let's talk about it. Mm. I mean, I'm I'm always struck by, you know, to, when we talk about games, games-based approaches, game-centered approaches, you know, again, it's the 70s when these ideas were floating around. You know, mm. people in physical education were talking about doing stuff that are that that are representative of the game modified versions of the game thorpe and bunker was 1982 and yet you know i i'm working in netball and other sports and people are, are saying to me i've never thought about starting my practice with a game <laughs> oh god this is a new idea this is a new idea so i don't you know i don't think we should be hard on ourselves something yeah. that's been around 40 or 50 years still hasn't landed really in our space so i'm not going to beat myself up about the fact that people confuse direct and instruction instruction i'm happy to correct i'm happy to correct and discuss but something you know something that is around that's games based that's been around 40 plus years people still go well that's a new idea isn't it and it's like mm. well not it isn't really <laughs> not you know not you know that seminal paper 82 and in the 70s before that from other authors these are not new ideas these mm. are not new ideas so it's a really interesting for our space, isn't it? About how how long things take to filter through, but also how resilient some ideas are, how incredibly resilient they are, despite evidence to the you know considerable evidence to the contrary. These ideas just stick around and are, and incredibly difficult to change. It, it it seems to me though that um, 
with like the direction direct instruction model yes. pedagogical model yeah and and the array of activities because i think you you in the past i remember um uh looked at is it rosenshine's yeah. um approach yeah. so I'll, I'll come back to what that what's in there because yeah. what's packed into the direct instructional pedagogical model yeah. uh there's a lot there's a lot in there yeah yeah and, yeah. and um well, as with all Stuart, i mean as with all of them if you do them properly they're yeah. jam-packed with things i mean it's <laughs> you know it's, it's not just do this one thing and everything will be fine if you work truly truthfully to whatever pedag you know if you're you if you use an authentic pedagogical model and you do it authentically it's jam-packed with stuff and i think and, and again one of the issues for us arguably is when you get into that practitioner space when you get on the ground on the court on the grass you know and I've talked about this in other spaces. We there's a, you know from an academic point of view, there's a real issue of construct validity because the doing of it very, looks very similar at times. So people yes. will be doing very similar things, yes. and it will look in very similar look very similar. But the reasons why they're doing it and the explanation for it could be complete. Well, as you and I both know, will be completely different. I'm doing yes. this because, and I believe this is the mechanism or this is why it works. Yeah. Well. You know that sometimes those those arguments are, are or not even arguments. Those discussions are really really important for us to grow as a field. But at the same time, it's a bit like the fleas arguing over who owns the dog, isn't it? <laughs> so we've got some principles here that we know can create a learning environment that we know that we can give to coaches that we know will have an impact on our players. You know, let's let let let's just be let's let them do that, and then in another space we can talk about well. You know, what's the underlying mechanism for that? What's the cause? You know, what's the explanation for that? Yeah. And I think, you know, there's an art, you know, I was, I was once in a position where I would have argued vehemently about all of that stuff has to be connected, really connected. And I think as I got older and become a little bit more pragmatic, it's like, they are important conversations to have and the links are important, but how important are they? You know who you know talk about who whose game is it <laughs> you know whose game is it is mm -hmm. it us as theory you know conceptual people or is it the people trying to deliver stuff and what are we trying to do to improve their world so you know it's not to d dismiss those discussions in any way and it's not to diminish them their importance mm -hmm. but i think we get almost lost in those at times mm -hmm. whereas and i think there is a huge construct validity issue you know i my personal view is that if I got an exceptional CLA practitioner, an exceptional TGFU practitioner, an exceptional direct instruction practitioner, and they delivered it in an authentic and effective fashion, one, it would look very, very similar what they were doing. And two, I, you know, what would be the outcome? Would we end up with, say, well, this is better than that? Uh, I don't think we would. I just mm. don't think we would. And that's part of the, you know, the construct validity of some of these ideas, which mm. tells me, that in their stage of development they're not they're not fixed yet we've not landed on the answer really and again a problem for me is that people position themselves position themselves as they have landed on the answer it's like well it's a way of looking at it and it's and we and these ideas are still evolving mm. and let's let's just think about it in those terms where i go no this is it this is the way this is the only way and it's like okay that's that's just not helpful for anybody i don't I, I, you're entirely right um but what's interesting is and this has been particular this has been i guess a, a prevalent conversation recently with yeah. some of the stuff that's emerging particularly around a conversation around sort of it depends and this yeah. notion this notion now <laughs> okay <laughs> we're going there we? no we don't have we don't have, we don't necessarily have to go there and, and to be honest i don't really want to go, i don't really want to go there because your your point is a good one which is to say you know um there's a lot of stuff that's in in constant development and yeah. and and actually like you say you know take a cla practitioner a tgfu practitioner a direct instruction practitioner there's every chance that what they're doing has a degree of similarity and Absolutely. and 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 outcome wise it can the bit that i i i have an issue with you see and this is where you know people i guess maybe have misunderstood some of the things i've been saying which is which they're sort of saying no no only it's one size fits all you know it's you it's, it's only one way there's a magic bullet and this is it that's not what what people are saying what they're saying is if like your theoretical understanding of how learning happens is rooted for example in a particular theoretical base then there are there are 
there are ways of using a particular method that won't map on. So, for example, you can use instruction. You can work if you're rooted in an ecological conceptualization yeah. of human learning. Yeah. Instruction is still a valid tool yeah. used in a very different way for a very different purpose. Yeah. And you have to understand that. And I think that's the bit that people are misunderstanding is to say people don't say, well, oh, you can't use instruction if you're working ecologically. Of course you can. You would yeah. just use it differently in a different way. So I think I think uh, and I've written a little bit about this around. I call it pseudo principles. <laughs> <laughs> so so there and, and I get again, I think it's around misunderstandings mm. and pseudo principles and fault and falsities emerge. So the classic for me around games-based learning is, oh, you can only ask, ever ask people questions. And it's mm. like, well, who's, who ever said that? Mm. But you, you, I can read it. I can read it in coach development material where game, you know, a game-centered approach, coach behavior equals questioning. And mm. if you're not asking questions, you're not doing games, a game-centered approach. And it's like, well, that's not true, is it? Mm. That's, a, that's a pseudo principle mm. that gets ossified because people say it over and over again. Mm. And as it kind of filters down, you, you know, you, you end up with misunderstandings and contradictions. So, I, I mean, I take your point. Paradigm doesn't define method, but it'll define how you might use the method. Exactly right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, that's you know, in methodology and in practice, the paradigm doesn't define what you use. It really, really defines how you will apply it and use it and what outcomes you might expect from it. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that. But I'm, you know, disappointingly, that is not what I hear. No, I know. I guess that's where I was going with my original question around the instruction. Yeah. So you've circled me back nicely. Well, well played. I like it. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, my, because what I was thinking is, if you've got this package of yeah. uh, tools that sort of are wrapped in a, um, in the direct instructional title. Yeah. But what we've done, basically, it seems is, or what, sorry, not what we've done, what's happened over the years for a, right, a variety of reasons is we've almost stripped out all the nutritional goodness and we're left with the husk of just telling yeah which is what people associate with that yeah so my, i guess my question is and if that also and by the way and that still is a pretty prevalent model yeah, in okay. terms of yeah. how coaches operate partially i guess because of that's what their experiences were so my question i suppose is how do we make sure we bring the nutritious stuff back in well i think yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, again, typically I'll speak to the netball example because that's what I'm emerged in currently and what's most relevant to me. So typically in netball, we warm up, we do footwork, we do an unopposed technical practice. We do some form of pattern of play where we run around cones uh, and then we have a game at the end. <laughs> That is a typical, typical model. And coaches will stand at the side and tell players stuff. That's a typical model. <laughs> and that the resilience of that and the resistance to changing that, you know, we you know, we can't there's a there's a variable here, and that's the population and the people doing it. So we can have these kind of higher level discussions about what works, what doesn't, how we might do stuff and how things complement or don't with each other. But when you get on, you know, the, the reality of being on the ground, looking at coaching is like, okay, that those, that those discussions are literally academic. I mean, they are so far away from the problem that I'm facing here. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and, and even on a call last night, you know, we're, we're trying to, trying to get, move people away and think, think more about modified games the game being the vehicle for the pedagogy and then you know and connecting it to all other things as the thread but even you know even it's not even resistance it's it's a res the resilience of these ideas that you have to get skillful first before you do this and you have to isolate skill and practice it a lot before you can put it into any kind of game it's just endemic and it's incredibly resistant and incredibly challenging. So for me, it, it, the nutritional value comes back to, you know, so we've done a piece of work in netball where we've looked at the learning outcomes. And I've basically, so I'm really lucky in that um, the, the, it's a video assessment. So all the coaches video themselves. So I've done an, an analysis of all the videos. 
and I've done a time on task analysis. I've looked at their behavior and I've looked at their practice design. And even though a game sense approach under, apparently underpins our practice, that's not what coaches are delivering in their assessments. They're really? The data. So even when we present it, so, but I've then I've asked the question, so who models it for them? How do they know what good looks like? So it's incredibly abstract at the moment and how it's delivered isn't particularly clear. Uh, and again, work outside of sport, showing people, you know, so I've, uh, you know, I've done endless presentations about some of these ideas and it's only landed where I've basically said, right, stop there. Let's go into the gym and I'll just show you what I mean. I'll just give you, and it's not, it's not, you don't copy it. It's not a magpie situation where you just do what I do. I'm going to talk you through an example of this, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And the luck and the penny drops there. I'm struck. I mean, I don't know if you, you know, there's a fantastic you know, reach for the sky, Douglas Bader, right? The guy, the Spitfire pilot from the yeah. Second World War, who lost both his legs in an air crash. So he's he's on prosthetic legs and he's posted into a squadron, right? Uh, Canadian squadron at Duxford and they find out that he's disabled and they're like you know you've got to be kidding me right what a joke and he goes into the mess and he's trying to speak to them and they're just not having him you know he's got his rank he's got his uniform he's been put in charge and they're just not have, having him so what he does basically is he puts his flying hat on jumps in a plane and just basically flies and does like an aerobatic display lands and they're like right okay we get it we get it you can do it so it's a little bit like that, you know, so you can, you, people need to see what good looks like and you need to demonstrate them to them the benefits of it. Mm. So part for me, it's not just PowerPoint people to death and it's not just t telling, it's not telling them, <laughs> you know, instruct information only is a zero level instructional strategy. Even direct instruction says that. <laughs> you, know, that you can grade the instructional quality. Just telling people stuff is a zero level instructional strategy. So us just telling people that this is good and this is better or this might work better is not enough. So I've learned very quickly that we need to show examples, model stuff and present information to folks, to them, to them to see it, to go, all right, I understand what that looks like that now. And then co-work, you know, then the other the other kind of error that we do is then we just throw the ball to them and say, right, now you go and do it. And we step into assessor mode, stand back with a clipboard and pen and just watch them flounder through it rather than co-coaching and collaborate with them and scaffold, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, OK, this I'm going to be with you and we'll do it together. Mm. And then you can ask questions and I can step in. And it's it's called coaching, right? We can go through that more coaching approach. So my long winded answer to the, your question is we need to show people what it looks like and we need to work with them to help them de develop their understanding and expertise. I think PowerPoints and Twitter posts ain't going to cut it. Um, you're, I mean, on, on so many levels, you're uh, you know, resonating, I guess, with many of the things that, you know, I've talked about for several years, not just on this yeah. podcast, but also professionally. So, which is the, your con you know, your conceptualization of, you know, kind of co co coaching, co creating, yes. uh, moving away from the, assessor mode like you say and more towards the here's here's what can help here's what can yeah. help in this moment here's what can help you know the guide by the side maybe that yes. kind of notion well and if you're stuck ask me and if you're still stuck let's just step aside i'll take over i'll take mm. over the wheel and i'll drive it for a little bit mm. and then you can watch mm. and then you can work with me and i think that coaching collaborative approach you know it, the the annoying thing about it is it's time consuming and mm. labor intensive mm. but if we're serious about you know 40 something years and people are still asking me what a games based approach is so you know time to change right so we've tried to do it this way forever and it you know let's be honest it hasn't landed so i think it's a time to change mm. and and create those environments where we co-create and collaborate and and work with our learners who are coaches to help them develop those skills and understanding and when you're in the room you can ask you know you can ask and it's like okay it's fine I can take the wheel here let me you know this is here's some ideas of how I might handle it now 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 you take the wheel and you have a go with that mm. and mm. and it is that scaff that scaffolded practice that supported practice as people get more confident and and I think 
again a real you know a real it's land you know i kind of knew this but what's landed home in netball particularly is the, the coaches are incredibly confident in one sense but not in many other ways it, and for me it's a lack of confidence of like you know as head of coaching they almost there's a like can i do this it's like mm -hmm. yeah is it okay for it not to go well yeah of course it's fine so there's the uh, and this confidence a lot. I don't, I don't. I'm, I'm nervous to do it. So I think there's this building of competence and confidence because we're in the competence and confidence business. Whatever the mechanism you choose to do, to introduce it, we we want to make people feel more confident in what they're doing and more competent in what we're doing, what they're doing. And if there's anything in our systems and processes that, that aren't doing that, we need to get rid of them, right? And I think a lot of the ways that we deliver coach development and coach education actually doesn't help people feel more confident and more competent. It, it erodes it, actually. You know, high stakes assessment, people in assessor mode, it, you know, it, setting people up to fail. I, this is a really, for a novice learner, this is really challenging. And we're expecting them just to go and do it and do it perfectly. And then we're going to assess them on it and tell them that it wasn't very good. I mean confidence and competence i don't think so that's and, and and using languages in assessment using language in assessment and say we're not going to talk about pass or fail we're going to say competent or not yet competent in yeah. somehow that somehow softens the blow <laughs> <laughs> seriously and I, I, you know if you're doing it you know i'm 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 very much in a assessment uh, for learning so you yes. do it continuously and you work with people over time and you see where they're going off track and you offer them support. And that's how you, excuse me, how you differentiate and individualize programs. So again, you know, some interesting work in the police space, they were very much assessment of, of learning. It's high stakes, high pressure at the end. And they're like, well, we don't understand why these people are passing. And so, well, I can tell you why. Because <laughs> you you, it's, it's all loaded on this high pressure, high stakes, one-off opportunity Whereas if you do this a little bit and identify, you know, you can start differentiating it, making it more learner centered and supporting people through there. And, you know, and then the assessment at the end, the pressure's off, the pressure's off because you, you've you used it as a, as much for a learning tool as an assessment tool. And I think, again, that's something we could learn in, in coach development, certainly. And I know that some people work to that, work to that framework uh, and are doing those sorts of things. But I also know that there are still high stakes end of point assessments and i i would dearly love you know and this is kind of maybe maybe this is a utopian dream but but i think it's it's an ideal worth striving for because yeah. if we only got halfway there it would still be better yeah, oh, yeah. Which, which is that the whole i mean let's face it sort of coach coach ed as we know it yeah. has become an industry Oh, it is an industry. And it's become in industrialized in its approach because the only way you can work in su at such mass volume is to industrialize. And of course, to industrialize means that you you strip everything back in your in your quest for efficiency. Yeah. And so, you know, it's about mass information transfer in short windows uh, with, you know, some form of, like you say, high stakes, high wire active assessment at the end of it. Yeah. And somehow we think that that is a useful educational model. And I'm, I love that quote. I'm glad you said it twice because I was scribbling it down rapidly around information only is a zero level instructional strategy. The bulk of these two and a half day courses are information only in reality, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Well, uh, and again, it's, it's really interesting. We look at, um, now again, there's there's a pattern of coaching in netball, and it's more in the in the performance space. Well, we've already talked a little about in the performance space, and it's very at, at face value, it feels good. Okay, so activities are set up. You know, the activity carries a lot of the water. It's uh, there are conditions, or in your terms, constraints applied. It all seems fine. And then there's technology and there's a little review at the end. But when you strip it back, it's 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 instru it's instructional. It's just telling people stuff. And and I think it's useful in kind of the declarative, the what knowledge. So people yeah. are learning more about the, the what, but it doesn't ever yeah. circle back to the procedural. So so now how do I take that, what you've told me? and put it back into my game or evolve and grow as a, as a player. 
So essentially the coaching bit's missing. <laughs> it becomes an in-transfer of information rather than a coaching exercise. Mm. You know, however you choose to intervene, mm. you know, whatever you choose to do, that, but there's stuff missing. You know, and, and, and you know, the direct instruction folk like Mayer and Kirscher and those guys, just telling people is a waste of time. It's mm. an absolute waste of time. It'll mm. just go in here and out there. Mm. Because it does, you know, they there's no opportunity to use it. There's no opportunity to put it into your own words. There's no opportunity to go and experiment with it. There's no opportunity to have some supported practice of it. Yeah. There's all of these things are missing mm. from just telling people stuff. Mm. And they do not connect to learning, unfortunately. And on the flip side, um, just having just only experience of something, as yeah. in, there's a game, go and play it. Oh, yeah. learning's happening mag magically. Learning's happening ma magically, which is the accusation often made to games-based practitioners, non-linear yeah. approaches, which isn't, which is equally inaccurate, yeah. <laughs> right? But that is equally, uh, you know, has has a lack of, you know, kind of um, value. Yes. In, in the same way as just telling does it uh, you remind right. me of something rod thought once said to me when i was fortunate enough to spend some time with him which is i think he said um kids doing games kids doing games is better than kids doing drills but if it's only games then it's only just better if that's something along those lines i'm probably yeah, yeah, butchering yeah. the quote yeah you're absolutely right and i think there's a i mean what what's interesting for me is Doing, doing, you know, if you're going to do increasingly complex versions of a whole task, if you're going to modify games, if you're going to structure games and do it in a progressive fashion to bring out the learning you want, that's actually really difficult and it's yeah. incredibly challenging for the coach. Mm. It's incredibly challenging for the coach. So the, the pedagogical responsibility increases massively. And I think, you know, it's really, you know, and we have to bear that in mind when we're developing coaches, you know, we're asking people to think about how they deliver their coaching differently, but we're also loading work onto them. The responsibility and the challenge increases as well mm. because it's pretty easy, you know, so it's pretty easy. It's 15 minutes on that. It's 15 minutes on that. It's 15 minutes on that. And we'll play a game on the end session done. I mean, it's, that's not particularly challenging. Uh, uh, and not particularly great for learning but to do to do it the other way in an in effective fashion is incredibly challenging and that pedagogical responsibility grows immensely and we, I don't think we really prepare coaches for it but you're right I think just standing back and letting a game just people play a game well how are they connected to the be learned to the material to be learned how do we know that they're the exaggeration or their focus is in the space where we want them to be. You know, how are we getting, how are we drawing the learning out? So that modification, how you, how you shape the game is really, really important. So d don't get me wrong. If you set it up right, like the game can carry a hell of a lot of water for you mm. because you're getting the right type of movement, the right type of repetition, the correct problems, the questions are being posed by the game. Yep. And that we're allowing the players to figure that out during it. Yeah. Uh, you know so coaching through the game is really really important and really helpful and it can carry a lot of the water but we can still coach in the game there's still an intervention space <laughs> yeah and that's yeah. how we you know when things are slightly going off track or we can work with individual players or we can identify that's an issue or there's a there's a problem that is that, that the players aren't figuring out well let's just stop and mm. think about how we might intervene and and get over that hump and then get you back into that game Mm. that for me so the through the game piece is really really important but coaching in the game is equally important and 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 it's skillful intervention it's not just you know doing stuff because it's on your list you know i've got five coaching points i need to bring them out well no that's not really meeting the learner's needs is it <laughs> you know you're not really reading the situation so for me you know again working outside of sport but also in it now, if you set if you set the practice up your modified version of the game well and you get the conditions right and it's doing everything it just frees up so much of your ability to now look at individual learners and say okay what's happening here 
what what's going on are there things i want to reinforce are there things i want to tweak is this person having a problem because i know that the basic framework of the practice is carrying a lot of the water for me i don't have to worry about it but you know to say that's easy to do it's not it's really really difficult to do and it takes practice and time i mean what tends to happen and i've noticed this again with novice coaches or people who are new to the approach what tends to happen is they don't let the game flow so they set up a modified version of the game and they just don't let it happen so people don't play (laughs) so within 30 seconds they've stopped it and then they play again for another minute and it's just stop 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 endlessly so it's not a game anymore it's something else or they just stand back and do nothing and just go and, and you can see you know so so breakdown will happen during the game it might be a decision making issue or it might be a skill related issue so what's causing you know what's happening when is it happening? Why is it happening? And what now as a coach are you going to do? Or are we just going to sit back and watch? So, I th- and again, that novice piece, you're either in all the time getting your coaching points over whether people want it or want them or not, or you're standing back and watching it. And it's all unfolding in front of your eyes, but you're like, uh, 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 don't know, you know, the game's doing it for me. It's like, I'm not sure it is, actually, if you really look closely at what's happening. But again, that's an education practice development piece to get people to think like that. I think you make an interesting point. I'd be, be, I wouldn't mind dwelling on it for a little bit, which is this idea of it being a being hard. Yes, I, I, I I do agree. Um, but I wonder if there are some dynamics at play here. So, you mentioned earlier on, um, which something again, which I really resonates, the idea that you know some of these practices, uh, or or approaches are sort of culturally resilient the, yeah, the notion right. the, the notion of instruction the notion or telling not not yeah. instruction as we've come to understand it yeah. and the notion of forming a practice led by technique that then is applied in some kind of game context at the end and these fra- these sorts of frameworks are very very culturally resilient and i think most of the time when you you see language in any of the literature or whether it's in Twitter or in discussions around traditional forms, that's what they're espousing. And I know instruction gets lumped into the traditional form, but not tradition as we're describing it, tradition, the empty husk that we're talking, we've been talking about earlier on, right? Uh, Sorry, not tradition, uh, instruction. So we, we have this scenario where we've got all these traditional forms that are culturally resilient. We look at, now I think because whether coach education has reinforced this or or coach education has been because of its delivery mechanisms and the industrialized delivery mechanism has been woefully inadequate in addressing some of these culturally resilient things so even if you do go on your two and a half day or your four week or whatever it is course where you talk about not doing some of these things unfortunately because they're so culturally resilient either the individual struggles to rid themselves of the habit or it's so prevalent elsewhere that you fall back into the habits that are being espoused by everybody around you because things yeah. become culturally normalized. Yeah. I will get to my question in the, in a minute, trust me. <laughs> um, so um, you got that concept and then yeah. you got that sort of like background, if you like. Um, and then, and then when we get to this uh, situation, when we try to articulate these different things, it's really hard then people who've kind of, come from that world to take on these new ideas because they seem so alien however if it's all you've ever known it's perhaps easier and i'm seeing a younger generation of coaches that i'm starting to work with more and more who kind of have known for whatever reason because say there's been increased prevalence of say either game-based ideas or ecological principles adopted by certain organizations who are espousing game-based principles that there's a younger generation of coaches who've known nothing else and so to them it's almost more it's more natural and i see them being some really excellent practitioners i've got to be honest when it comes to these kinds of approaches yeah agreed i think there's a you're you're absolutely right um but we have we have to and I think your points are really well made, Stu, to be fair. Um, I think we have to bear in mind the incredible low impact endeavour that coach education is. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, and what I mean by that is that in netball, I can start playing at six. Mm. I can be in a league at six. I can be being drilled at six. Mm. And if I'm good, I'll get sucked into a space where that is how coaching is done and that's how the game you know so incredibly competitive 
uh, very skilled, very skills focused, uh, very committed to a position early, look very competitive. So they're six years old. They play to a decent level, and they're gonna they're gonna receive this coaching for twenty years, twenty years probably, yes. and then think, Do you know what? I'm interested in transitioning into coaching. And this person comes onto a course and, and basically says, do you know the, the thing that you've been receiving for the last 20 years? <laughs> we might have an issue with it. <laughs> and, 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 not, and I've got seven hours with you to try and undo all of that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, and, and the analogy I use is like a pea elephant and a pea shooter. You know, I've got an <laughs> elephant charging towards me and I'm armed with a pea shooter here. <laughs> I've got no chance. I've got absolutely no chance on yeah. this. So I think there's that cultural, you know, that apprenticeship of observation is so, so powerful. And and I have this conversation in netball all the time. The players of today are coaches tomorrow. So what we're embedding and normalising with those players now, we're going to have to undo probably when they t when they arrive for some coaching and coach development later. And, and that's why, because it's 20 plus years versus 20 hours. You know, who's going to win in that fight? By definition, who's going to win? Mm. And then I think your point around, you know, there's really good evidence around the washout effect. So even if this person comes, you know, works with us over a period of time, totally buys into the idea, is, con is a convert. They go back to their organization and they start doing that. And, and people are going, what are you doing that for? <laughs> what are you doing that for that's not how we do it here so that washout effect is incredibly powerful so all of that work you know i think uh gareth morgan who's with the fa now did his phd and the same you know the washout effect was so powerful you know he did an amazing intervention with a group of coaches and within six months they were back to working as they were originally not because they necessarily wanted to, but because the pressure on them to work like that was just beyond resistance. It was it was just washed out. Mm. So there there are these there's bigger issues at play, you know, and, and the coach development is one piece of the one piece of the puzzle really. So it, it is about our competition structures. It is about how we present winning and losing to our players. It is about their experience of sport through the life through their lifetime. You know, to that to today's players and tomorrow's coaching. So those six year olds in twenty or thirty years time are going to arrive, some of them, on a coach development course. And we're going to have to try and undo all of this stuff. So, you know, so for me, it's as much about you know, I think there's a conceptualization if you think about sport as the house, that coaching is just a room that you repaint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's fun. <laughs> You know, you just, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring you in as head of coaching. There's, there's the coaching room, just repaint it and everything will be fine. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on a minute. So I'm going to do this with our coaches, but they're going to go into a competition and league structure that looks like this. They're going to go into an environment that think, looks at winning and losing like this. They're going to go into an environment where we conceptualize players in this particular way. So you can't do that without attacking that. So I guess, you know, being a little bit revolutionary here. So it's a, it's not just about what we do in coach development. It's about the wider sporting cultures and how we conceptualize player development through, you know, starting from the very youngest stages, those foundation years through into talent development, into competition. What does that look like? Because those things drive coaching practice massively. How we reward coaches drives coaches practice. So we can do our seven hours or 20 hours or whatever, but it's small fry in relation to that, all that other stuff that we're battling against, really. So for me, system change is about the system. It's not just about the coach development or the coach education piece. And and I think that, I mean, that speaks so loudly, I think. I mean, I think that's a, a brilliant analogy and I'm going to, I am mercilessly going to steal that. <laughs> the idea, it's funny actually, because actually when I, when I did the first coaching plan, we talked about this idea of a coaching house. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, lots of different rooms. I never thought about this, but you're right. In a in a kind of in a sport in the world of sport governance, you know, with all of the competition and performance and participation and all the different clubs yeah. and all the different elements that a sports organisation operates within, coaching is a room that you just repaint. And actually, I'm seeing that playing out a little bit um, at the moment. You know, because there's actually a lot of challenges 
hitting sports, lots of sports at the moment. You know, the most probably the most the most prevalent one at the moment is the, the gymnastics related stuff. Yeah, cool. And strangely, though, it seems to me like the whole industry is beset with and, and coaching coach ed, the coach education industry is just as bad. Yeah. You know, the, the whole the whole idea of you know if the only tool you've got is a hammer every problem is like a nail we 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 almost think right okay well there's a big problem there culturally within the sport right coach education is going to solve that so all we've got to do is repaint the coach education room or refurbish it and it'll be fine we'll educate our way out of this cultural problem and not understanding that the coaches were weren't operating in a, a vacuum they weren't going, you know, they weren't they weren't basically saying, oh, well, I've learned all this stuff on my coach education and I'm going to make sure that I do this kind of abusive behavior because it's really what they've told me to do. They're operating in a in a kind of an invite in a set of environmental um whether it's constraints or whatever it is, attractors that are extremely difficult to right. pull against without yeah. without being ostracized or in some cases losing your job or whatever it might be. I mean it's no, don't get me wrong. I think coaches and coaching can be an agent for change, mm. but at the moment the deck's stacked against them, <laughs> mm. isn't it? The deck's yeah. stacked. You know, we can you can only do so much. You can only you can only influence so much. There has to be some other stuff happening as well. I mean, if you want the analogy, house, and I've just thought of it here, and I don't know if it's any good, but I'll say it out loud. You know, coaching. <laughs> in, if if it's a house analogy, coaching isn't a room. It's the central heating. I was just thinking the same thing. It's it's in all of the rooms and it can maybe it's because we're both shivering at right? the moment. <laughs> all of that stuff. So, you know, it's not an isolated space. It's all interconnected. And but the influence of coaching and coaches uh, is only so much without it, without you know, without all those other considerations. You know, because we're in you know, we're in the environment, you know, it's not just something in which you're dropped. You are part of the environment. The environment is part of you. And all of these things are interconnected. Um, and, and you know, and we've stacked the deck against coach education. There's no way. It's it's largely performative, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it, it's... it's in many ways. And, and, and what we've done historically as well, and this comes back loud and clear when you speak to coaches about their experiences, yeah. is what we do is in an effort to sort of clean house to sort of take the analogy a little further yeah. what we do is we don't we don't we don't rip out the like the really bad um pipe work that we've yeah. got or the really old boiler that's generating the heat yeah. and is really inefficient and is yeah. not really doing what it needs to do we don't do that what we do is a series of patches and fixes yeah. that that fix you know fix temporarily this leak only in one place but not in the other and yeah. and what that does is basically puts additional burden on the entire system and when i mean the system i mean the individuals in it yeah. and yeah. and so all we do is layer on burdens the role gets more and more challenging and difficult and all we do is we keep saying well you've got to do this 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 and this before you can even set foot on a court or set foot yeah. on a pitch and that's just enormously demotivating to individuals who haven't started from a, a position of deciding to do harm. Yes. They just live in a culture that does it. Yes, quite. I think there's a, and again, I've written a little bit about this um, around the whole. Um, and to be honest, that what annoys me a little bit about the toolbox metaphor. Yeah, yeah. I can I can see its utility, but I also it also grates on me a little bit about that. Everything else is fixed. We're just going to give you more tools. <laughs> and it's like, well, hang on a minute. There might, there's a bigger, you know, that's very instrumental. You know, this whole behavioral retooling piece. Okay. But that's not transformative, is it? That's not, that doesn't make big changes. That doesn't, that, you know, that, that it's not, it's additive, not transformative, I guess, is what I would say. And again, the language that I try to talk about is that we're not adding, we're not adding fixes and patches here. We want to actually transform what things look like for it to, to have any chance or for it, for it to be meaningful. But we're, you know, and, and the toolbox metaphor is in that additive, give, you know, with all, all the other things are equal. We're just going to give you more tools. It's like, well, I'm not sure that's going to fix this problem, actually. You know, we need to take a bigger step back and look at this in a more transformative way, you know. One of one of my oft oft quoted phrases is the can of petrol in a box of matches. <laughs> you know, we actually need to burn it down and start again sometimes. <laughs> you no, know, because do we just keep bolting stuff on mm. 
this behavior this behavioral retooling piece expecting it to change uh, you know the, expecting this wider or bigger change and it just doesn't happen and then we're scratching our heads wondering why because we're not actually transforming anything actually it's all very you know again i quite like this as an idea and it's not it's not my i'm stealing it shamelessly but you know people think they're thinking outside of the box but they couldn't be more inside the box if they tried because <laughs> the whole point is we need to get rid of the freaking box <laughs> you know that's the point isn't it you know this is out of the box thinking it's like well it isn't because you're still in it <laughs> <laughs> you're still you couldn't be more in it if you tried yeah. you know the box needs to we need to get rid of the damn box the, it, you um you speak to a point i think that's uh uh, you, you, when you said earlier about coaches coaches and coaching being a potential agent for change yes. but they that's stacked against them I think you're totally right because that's I think one of the frustrations I've felt having worked in this field for yeah. the bulk of my career and I think most people who work in this field you know so basically having you know spending time with people like you who are working either you know on the theoretical side you know essentially trying to give theoretical validity to some of this stuff yeah. to help those in these in these areas and say look look the research saying this we need to do this that kind of thing yeah. that's the goal but then yeah. when you're also at the coal face of well we're not at the coal face but when you're trying to build a system that will help those at the coal face you, you're doing that because you just want to give people a, a chance yeah. to be the agent for change yeah and and we know how 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 many how much the card, cards are stacked against them now the problem you often have is decision makers look at the way the cards are stacked against them and go that's too big a problem to solve. Yes. And so it's almost like we throw our hands in the air and say, yeah. well, we'll do what we can. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, and you see so many new strategies and so many new aspirations. And one of the frustrations I suppose I have is when you see some strategies that are, that espouse what is, I believe is to be a, a genuine cultural transformation, you know, or at least a vision of a genuine cultural transformation. Well, okay. Well, we better bloody mean it this time. And I'm not 100% sure that those within the system can even conceptualize what that might look like. Now, I'm not saying, oh, I do, and, and ooh, no, I, I don't. I don't know what it'll look like. But I know that there's something there that we all ought to be taking steps towards. Yes, I, I totally agree. And the danger is these things become rhetorical. Mm. And you just layer on the cynicism then. Mm. <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, here we go again kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, why why is it going to work this time? Because it hasn't worked the last 25 times when we've said we've said all of this stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, these are not straightforward things to fix, are they? I mean, there, there needs to be commitment and alignment and, you know, arguably money. People, you know, follow the money. The money needs to support this stuff. Um, and and think you know reward the right things doing the right things in the right way need to be rewarded and i'm not sure that they currently are in the way that we think about how sports funded and that those structures particularly um so it's yeah it's a it's a multi-variate multi-faceted thing of which coaching is a variable in it yeah yeah but i guess my my one of my frustrations, and this could just be a this could just become like a counselling session, peer to peer counselling <laughs> session, where we just rail against the machine. Look, yeah. I see a lot of change. I see a lot yeah. of positivity. Oh, yeah, yeah, I cool. see a lot of yeah. good things taking yeah, place. Yeah. I see good people in good roles bringing yeah. about change, and I do see. I have actually think I see. I do think I see a different, a different language around coaching. I hear. Yes. I think there's a community. I think there is there is a, a growing movement of individuals who are moving in this direction. I do yeah. think that's been a positive of social media. I know it gets an awful lot of hammer, but I think it's right. it's it's allowed the proliferation of ideas to take shape more readily. Yes. Um, and I do see a lot of room for positivity. Yeah. Um, my I guess pace is always my frustration in anything I do. Yeah. Uh, pace yeah. of change. The yeah. other bit that the bit I suppose is this is going to be required is. I think we probably sometimes – so one of the frustrations is, is that I would like coaching or coaching in all forms of workforce development, people development for that matter. I'd like it to be seen less as, a, as one of the things and yeah. more as, like you said, the central heating. You know, you could have a perfectly beautiful building, but it will be uninhabitable by virtue of the fact that it's got no central heating or plumbing yeah, or whatever right. it is. I'd like to see it more like that as one of the things that makes the whole place – 
feel more you know more habitable yeah but i'm not sure that that's how it is seen at the moment like you say it's seen as a room that you repaint from time to time yeah i think there's a i think there's a there is an issue of how how coaching is conceptualized and how it how it fits within strategies i think is an issue and i and i but i see this in the academy as well so how you know so working in a school at loughborough a really you know one of the top schools in the world in that space but within the, within the wider organization how sport is conceptualized it, it's like i'm not sure you actually get it mm. you, the words are coming out but you know from what you're saying to me there isn't this really deep understanding of what sport means mm. and i get a sense you know in sporting organizations the the words around coaching are coming out Mm. do you really really um you know do you really understand it do you really understand its value and what it offers you beyond the very instrumental you know very literal mm. and i just i just and again you know that's i'm in it so it's as much my fault as anybody about having those conversation and having those discussions about you know what actually is coaching um you know what what purpose does it serve in the you know what is the purpose in the organization how does it help develop and evolve the sport how can we restack the the dice or the cards to to for it to be the 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 tool for change that we want it to be and i just think there is there are misunderstandings about what it is and what it's for and as i say the the words sound right but it's like you know you start scratching at the surface it's like do you really get it do you really get it what it could be what the potential is and you know and again it's it's the competition of importances isn't it yeah you know that everything's really really important <laughs> you know and, and people have their pet projects and their areas of interest and you know there's a range of agendas in sport now and we get we get dragged to this agenda and that agenda and it becomes a competition of importances but ultimately that the, the coaching piece is the, the central heating you know that that's really connected to a lot of these other agendas and we need to take care of that as well and perhaps don't as well as we could do and, and as somebody working in the system in that way, you know, I have to hold my hands up and say, I need to be more persuasive. I need to get out there and make the argument and talk to people and really, you know, make sure that message is understood about where, where coaching can be, what we need to do with it. I, I resonate with what you've just said about being more persuasive. Yeah. Um, because as much as I can, you know, rail against the decision makers who just yeah. don't understand me and what I'm doing and how important it is yeah. at the same time, it is incumbent. I also recognise it is right. incumbent upon me to make the case better. We have to look at ourselves, right, yeah. and say, yeah. are we are we presenting this in the best possible way? Are we do we understand the best way to tell the story? Do we understand what it is these folks need to hear from us to make yeah. the argument persuasive? And I think you're right. It's very easy to point fingers and go, it's everyone else's fault. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. What you know? What what are we doing? You know, are we sure we've done the best that we can? to make these cases and the arguments do we understand the people that we work with do we understand what they need to hear from us in terms in terms of making that argument for mm. coaching and coach development and you know i'm not sure we are the best at it actually yeah and i know i mean listen i could talk about that i mean that that is a an entirely separate podcast but it's, it it's also a, it's also very timely because in the new year it's definitely something that I intend to launch into, yeah, and cool. and um th this this particular podcast I had an idea for it which was, and I've had an, this idea for some time because obviously this podcast has been mostly based based around the idea of you know kind of learning from practitioners and theorists and people learning from each other and and you know with a bit of an idea around sort of you know kind of ecological conceptualization giving that a little bit more voice but in actual fact one of the things i'm really keen on doing uh, moving forward and this is almost going to be maybe a little bit of a pilot episode for <laughs> a kind of a parallel podcast series called leaders in coaching which yeah. is the idea of those of us who are trying to persuade others those of us who are trying to bring about change and give the people on the ground a fighting chance yeah you know it's a that's a, that's a really difficult space to be it is very challenging it's very challenging because the not all the agendas align they align at, 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 there's a level where the agendas meet 
but as you work through the the agendas don't always align the timings don't align the priorities don't align that competition of importances is in play all the time it's constantly happening about what's important now then you then you've got the the, the firefighting the stuff that just happens you know and all that other stuff is it's a really challenging space to navigate i think um and we seem to have strolled a little bit away from direct instruction, don't we? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But in, in some respects, it brings me nicely back to it, which is the because I was going to say that um, maybe some of our, our persuasive tools are in that box called direct instruction. Or, or yeah, I mean, I think those, you know, for me, it's, it's how you conceptualize learning. Yeah. And I often... You know, it's very easy to, I don't know how, how authentic I am at doing this, if I'm honest. I hope I am reasonably authentic of walking the walk and talking the talk. So I'll talk about coaching and constructing environments and behaving in a particular way. But if you don't then do it yourself, then that's like, okay. So, you know, again, how am I setting up the environment? How am I presenting information? How am I checking for understanding? How am I letting people, you know, all of those things are really useful tools if I'm essentially educating others about our space and it's how often you do it. And I think it's really easy and and I I'm, hold my hands up, it's very easy to be sucked into doing a PowerPoint on something. Come and present to us about this. Mm. It's like, okay, is that if I wanna if I wanna create an environment where I'm educating a group of people in my organization is standing in front of them with 50 PowerPoint slides, the best way to do this. And I can tell you from experience that it isn't. But I should know that, but I should know that, right? But I still get sucked into doing it. He says, he says rapidly closing down the five 50, 50 slide PowerPoint decks he's got open on his desktop at the moment. Well, this is it. But that's, that we do it though, don't we? we? We talk about creating environments for learning and creating environments for understanding and learning over here like this. Hmm. And then go into an environment and do that, which is, you know, completely the opposite. It's hmm. Hmm. like, well, why am I present? You know, why am I doing it like this? And I, I've certainly, again, that you know, from that direct instruction space and that that group of researchers, there that you know, there's some again some online principles about how you present information online. You know, just really common sense advice. You know, the order, the sequencing. How do you get engagement? And it's like, do you know what? They're really hand they're just really handy tools mm. because you're trying to create a learning environment. Yes, it's a presentation about this, but you are trying to create an environment where people are going to listen to you, understand it, apply what you've taken, you know, apply what you've given to them and give it back to you in some form or other. So why wouldn't you apply those principles? But I think it's, you know, we're not perfect, are we? And I think it's very easier for us to fall into the trap of the well-established cultural norm of doing things <laughs> yeah. Yeah, i'm totally with you listen chris um i'm uh, unfortunately going to come crashing into on time onto my into my next appointment for the day um and, and i know we could have talked for an awful lot longer i'm yeah, hoping fine. i'm hoping you might be up for a part two because i think yeah, there's of course, of course. there's Happy a lot to there's Happy a lot to, to un that. unpick but i but thank you for coming on and Pleasure. uh well clearing up a misunderstanding for me and then also uh i guess indulging me in what was a bit of peer, peer support <laughs> yeah that's fine it's absolutely fine it's absolutely fine it's been enjoyable like i say you know i think with, there's lots of common ground in this space and and for me it's just respecting that and like you know it, it's a bit it's a bit of a cliche isn't it but for the greater good how do we how do we make coaching better? How do we make our learners better? How do we develop coaches? How do we bring you know everything has there's always something to glean or some everything has something to offer. And for me, it's about looking for those common spaces, those common grounds to advance us rather than drawing the battle lines and endlessly fighting over things, which mm. I don't think is in any way productive. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. And again, that might be a good conversation in part two. Yeah, fine. Um Listen, um, um, people might, I know, I know you're fairly easy to track down um, <laughs> in, in the wider community. Is, is there a good way for people to reach out if they wanted to have so, a chat? Um, so, yeah, if you go, if you Google me, you'll see my uh, university email will probably come up best, come up first. 
Well, it depends what sort of question you want to ask. If it's a research kind of generic question around coaching the university space, if it's something specific around netball and netball coaching, obviously the England netball space. I'm also on Twitter at Coach C1, so people can reach out and DM me if they want to chat. Absolutely fine. Brilliant. Right, really appreciate you coming on. Um, I hope you have a great Christmas. You too, sir. Um, I'm hoping this will go out over Christmas so people have got okay. it to listen to whilst they're walking dogs or whatever it is. <laughs> but if not, it'll come out in the new year, in which case this is all completely moot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, of course.